sorry to be MIA for so long. I've been really busy on all fronts. Um, as you might notice, <laughs> the room's changed again. So I've been not just busy with my real job and busy with family. Um, I had to travel a little bit, but I've also been busy in hi-fi. I've been changing my room, adding, removing components. Um, so in my recent adventure, I took a hard turn um, in my cave diving adventure uh, for Hi-Fi. Um, I've been, so I started with the road to Mohabs where I uh, decided, okay, I wanted to go and explore the high sensitive speakers so that I could have much more of a playing field with more amplifiers, more gear, because I didn't want to be constrained with uh, demanding speakers. So it started with the Tectons and I was aiming to go from the 210 Perfect set that I had to go to the Moabs, their, their, their big ones, or maybe even the Encores. But um, I found something else. I decided to go even more of a different route, like to go in the ultra sensitive. And I also discovered full range drivers which I absolutely fell in love with. I'm gonna talk more about that um, later or in a future video. Right now I'm looking at open baffle, full range drivers, uh, crossoverless speakers, so no crossovers in them, uh, and obviously tubes. I've played with the solid state stacks and played with tube stacks. I'm a tube guy, I need tubes, I want tubes, I love tubes. Um, I even overdo it with tubes most Audio, advanced audio files will say that too much tubes is not a good thing. What's the expansion? So too much of a good thing ends up being a bad thing. Maybe for me so far, tubes, love it, love it, love it. Comes with a little bit of headaches, but I'm gonna dive into it a little bit more to explain to you guys. So before I kick back going into uh, new videos and talking to you guys about uh, the adventures of what I've been doing behind me, uh, where I'm going, what are the cha challenges I face, the speed bumps along the way when changing gear uh, and going down this route of uh, high sensitive speakers. I realize that there's a few follow-ups I need to do first from my last videos. Um, namely, today I'm, I'm going to talk about the Musical Paradise Phono Stage, a quick follow-up on that one. And then I'll do a also quick follow-up on the Azure Monoblock video that I did, just to kind of clear the air on both of those. Um, and once I've done that, then hopefully I'll have uh, another up-to-date video on my adventure where I'm at with, with my system in the next week or so. Yeah, yeah, I know, the next week or so. Guy hasn't posted in six months and now he's promising a video every week. So yeah, Musical Paradise, Phono Stage. Uh, the MPP2 that I had posted, the monster, the big one, you see me kind of holding it um, in, in the video. So what did I do? So I enjoyed its stock. Um, I changed a few things. First thing I changed was the tubes. The tubes that come stock in there, well, stock or not stock, using 12 AX7s or 6922 type, type tubes in that phono stage, made it that with certain cartridges, the gain is just incredibly high. So even on the lowest gain setting via the dip switches in the back, if you're using 12 AX7 tubes or 6922 tubes, those tubes have one of the highest gain uh, factors in that uh, family of, of tube sizes. So even by lowering the dip switches to make the, the, the gain as low as possible, at times and on some recordings with some records, it was still felt too high. Like you ended up getting a little bit of an edginess on top and you would, you would actually end up with a thinner sound because there was too much gain. So to fix that, then you have a whole choice of tubes you can go in that, in that same family, in the ECC8 family, I guess I think it's called. I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll, write, I'll write it down written down here to specify what kind of tubes. Um, you have a lot of choices. You can go all the way down in the gain factor and use 12 AU7s, but that, from from what I understood, that's like 30% of the gain of what a 12 AX7 is, which is really low. Then I'm not, I didn't do that because I was worried that now even on the highest gain setting, it wouldn't be enough. But you have a 12 AT7 tube that seemed to me like to be like the sweet spot. And with the cartridge that I had, it was a sweet spot. So by changing the four, yeah, four um, 12AX7 tubes that I had in the photo stage by four 12AT7s. Now, I didn't go crazy with the 12AT7s. You could if you wanted to. There's 
a slew of great tubes out there. There's great uh, new old stock that you can get your hands on that would just make this uh, phono stage skyrocket in performance. But I just used 1287s from uh, the um, Shuguang um, Natural Series. Easy, easy to find. Uh, they come in a nice little box. Um, not too expensive. And wow, it did the trick. It, it controlled the gain. Did it do anything else as far as sonic characteristics? A little? Not that much. Um... It did a little bit, but not enough for me to say, oh, wow, you, you, you got you, you to gotta roll these tubes that added something incredible. No. Had I put in like a set of uh, new old stock gold pin Mullard's 12ATSEVENS, yeah, that might have been a different story. That might have added some warmth. Um, that might have made things a little extra silky, possibly. But my goal with the tubes at first was just to get the gain under control and mission accomplished. It, it got it just right. Then... Then it was just a matter of playing in the in the 6.5 decibel range on the dip switches in the back to find a sweet spot that you like. And I was like, in heaven. Perfect. Second thing I did, I uh, changed the capacitors because the capacitors are easily rolled in this one. Thank you, Musical Paradise. That is a phenomenal way to do it. For the DIY guys that like to roll things, rolling tubes is one thing. Rolling caps is a whole set of fun as well. Just be careful though, no matter what caps you roll, even though they're easy to simply unscrew, I'll show you a picture, you just simply unscrew um, the, co the connections, they're kind of like speaker terminals, they look like that. You just unscrew them, you slide the uh, the original cap out of there and put the new one in, re-tighten re them down, no soldering needed. Be careful though, capacitors have a tendency to hold electricity even after the device is powered off. So make sure you give an ample amount of time before you go and roll the caps out of there or look it up online. There's ways to discharge capacitors. I'm not going to go into that now. I am not an electrician, so any information I would give you could be false or lead to injury. You are warned if you go to change the capacitors in a any electrical device, make sure you do your homework and consult a professional so you do not get a massive electric shock. Forward. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm surprised I'm still alive. Anyway, so I changed the capacitors from, I think they were, I'll say gold note. Anyways, I'll put them here. The capacitors that were in there, um, when I looked online to try to acquire the same capacitors to get an idea of how much they cost for a consumer, which means that for a manufacturer it would cost a fraction of that because they buy thousands of them at a time. I opted to go with Mundorf capacitors, well, because you have. To, I also went with what was readily available in the specs that I needed. I, that I needed, so I reached out to Gary at Musical Paradise. He was super helpful. He told me exactly what specs, uh, type of capacitors to go for. There's two different types um, that you can change in there. Change them um, to Mundorf uh, Mundorf oil caps. Man, I forget exactly which ones they were. They weren't the crazy one. They weren't the supreme evil ones. They were the mid-range ones. So the caps that were in there before, from a consumer perspective, ranged between eight and fourteen dollars a capacitor. The Mundorf ones I put in there ranged, um, if I'm not mistaken, were around fifty dollars a cap. So yeah, the upgrade was a few hundred bucks to change um, six six capacitors i think there's three yeah three per bank so one for the left channel and uh four for the left channel and four for the right channel so you're looking at three to four hundred dollars with the with the with the regular one you could go crazy i mean if you want to go buy jupiter's duluns uh vcap or down yeah i'm sure the sound will get even better but you're going to pay for those capacitors anyway so when i changed those mundorf caps wow okay so the details got better but it's not just the details that got better so you had think of it as uh if you if you're looking at uh, uh, or you want to, if you're feeling the, uh, the, the the textures of the notes, the textures just became, had a lot more feel to them, had a lot more um, presence to them. Um, have a look. I'm, so I'm putting like a picture frame up here. Think of it as though you are sort of cranking up the HDR on an image, but not to the point that it becomes cartoony or ugly and heavily colored. Just a little bit so that textures feel more apparent. The contrast is better. So... 
right away, I was th that was a noticeable difference. It wasn't, oh, I need to listen to this for a few weeks and then come back um, so that I can properly understand what's going on. No, 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 this is apparent right away. With, even with the jump that I did from like a $10 capacitor to a $50 capacitor, I could tell the difference. I could tell the difference right away. And even though it increased the detail, it also sounded smoother at the same time. You think like you, when you hype up the detail, if it's if it doesn't happen properly, it can become shrill. It can create an edginess to it. Like again, too much of a good thing. But no, this didn't do that at all. This just even though there was more detail, more texture, it also felt smoother at the same time. Yeah. So do it. It's I I think it's absolutely worth it. Um, this. $950 USD phono stage can be transformed into something magical. You got the tubes you can roll, you got the capacitors you can roll. And the one that surprised me the most was changing the two rectifiers. Yes, the rectifiers. So changing the rectifiers, uh, look, with a lot of things in hi-fi, don't believe everything you read online in forums or hear in YouTube videos or what you hear from sales uh, salespeople in stores. Don't believe everything and go and, and, and be super biased with that opinion you read on a forum or what a salesman has told you. No, give things a try. Look, guys, there's a reason why so many things are made to be interchangeable instead of just creating a bunch of black boxes that you can't do anything with. So rectifiers yeah, are not in the signal path. They convert electrical current from one style to another. Again, I'm not an electrician and I'm not gonna pretend I'm some expert because I read an article about it, no. But everyone that I spoke to said the same thing. Rectifiers don't change anything as far as sound quality. They are not in the signal path. All right, but why is that? But I got curious, I was like, but why is it that you can still get a rarity in demand for old, new old, like new old stock rectifiers. Why is it that some audio companies create super rectifier, external super rectifiers, where you hook up a cable to replace the rectifier that's in your device, whether it's an amp, a preamp, a DAC, um, and and now that rectifier links up to an external electrical box with massive tubes in them. Even tubes that are usually never used for rectifiers. It got me curious. I'm like, wait a second, there's got to be something. I decided I'm ordering uh, two rectifiers because there's two in the phono stage, right? One for the right, one for the left. Um, and you can switch the voltage for, I think, a variety of two or three different types of, um, of rectifiers. So luck would have it. I got my hands on a pair of new old stock rectifiers, larger kind. The one that comes in with it are 6X5s. And what I managed to get my hands on were um, 5A4G. Anyways, I'll post them here. Bigger, bigger ones. And Musical Paradise thought of this. That's why they have these massive holes at the top because you can put bigger rectifiers that stick out. That's what happened with these big ones. So I put these bigger rectifiers, these bigger Coke bottles, kind of looks like a traditional uh, 300B or 245B. Um, they they kind of look like that. Maybe not quite as big, but close enough. Yeah, so what happened uh, when I changed uh, the, the two rectifiers? Uh, the details, meh, yeah, maybe, yeah. can't say for sure that what it did much about the details. More bass, eh, not sure. The mid-range start glowing and the, the high start sparkling, not really. Something was going on, but man, I, I, I can't say for sure. And remember, this was just with the phono stage, like I still had stock rectifiers in, in, in my amp. I had stock rectifiers in my tubes. I mean, in my DAC, uh, I had stock rectifiers in my uh, tube buffer. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a while. Um, anyway, so something that it has, some of those things were affected a little bit, but I think it was just that they were side effects of what the real change, I mean, of what the main change was. So, for example, did it add color? No, I didn't notice that it added or, or changed the color. Did it make? Did it change the speed? Did it make it slower? Did it make it faster? Did it make it have more decay and so on? No, I didn't notice that. And by the way, I have a feeling that a lot of those, that speed versus decay, I think that's very hard to get both. Wait, so what happened when I changed the rectifiers? The soundstage, the soundstage all of a sudden was deeper. It was wider. And things became clearer as to where they belong in the soundstage. I didn't expect that. 
I didn't expect that. But man, was I happy because the new old stock rectifiers weren't cheap. Um, I'll give you an example of what happened. For those of you that are familiar with the Roger Waters album, uh, Amused to Death, right here. Track number six, which is called uh, Late Home Tonight, part one, I think. Um, in the intro, there's three or four water drops. You just hear it all. On an average system, so I'm going to say an average system. What I mean is a system that has a decent set of components that the positioning of the speakers to the listening area versus the acoustics of the room is decent. It's good. It's not overly refined. It's not like not too much thought was put into it. If you don't put too much thought into it, that water drop on your system might seem like it's to your, to your left. So I'm listening to my system. The drop would feel like it's somewhere somewhere over here if it was normally set up. Now, on a properly set up, properly, a more refined setup, no offense to anyone, on a more refined setup where your speakers have more breathing room, they're not put up against the wall, you're, like you're not sitting in the living room, um, you'll have an easier time getting this result. And now the result is that water drop, instead of being somewhere over here it lands on your shoulder no joke it's like it, it, it's like that water drop is landing right on your shoulder or like within that that space and it happens three four times at the beginning now when i put the rectifiers in what happened when i put the rectifiers in i i already had it coming down on my shoulder uh, in, in in the system the way it's set up now not every version of the system that i had here felt like it was on my shoulder i had at times that it was more like along the wall, maybe a little bit to the edge of, of the left speaker. Um, but I had it on my shoulder already. But when I changed the rectifiers, it was now behind me and maybe two, three feet farther back. So from where I'm sitting, the water drop was now somewhere over there as opposed to being on my shoulder. When my shoulder was roughly about here before, now it was like somewhere over here in that vicinity. It felt like I was pulled in. I was literally pulled into the music where everything and everything felt like it had a place and it was not just in front of me. There were things behind me now. But anyways, use this water drop. as a, It's a great reference to test soundstage. It really is. And FYI, it happens to all of us when you rotate speakers and you move things around and you're changing components. If you accidentally invert the connectors on your speakers you swap your positive and your negative creating an out of phase you have a speaker that's out of phase that will mess your sound stage up to a point where you will be ripping your hairs over your head if you don't know what's going on and when that happens all of a sudden it's like everything's flat in front of you you can't tell where the sound's coming from it's weird it can even give you an impression that your speakers disappeared but you don't know where the voice, the, the sounds are coming from. It's just weird. Anyways, that happens. Check your speakers. Make sure your key didn't, you didn't uh, invert your positive and your negative. So yeah, so rectifiers. I had a blast changing the rectifiers in that. So that phono stage, change the caps, change the tubes, change the rectifiers. Oh boy, there's a lot of fun to be had with that thing. And for the price, challenge you guys to find something that you can tweak at that price and that easily tweaked. Remember. Yes, you could solder anything onto a circuit board of any other devices. But depending on how much that device costs, I'm sorry, but you might have um, bigger cojones than I do if you want to take a soldering gun to a 10 plus thousand dollar piece of equipment. I, I have a hard time doing that at this point. Maybe it's because I suck. 